By 1882, it was producing electricity. In 1918, when Paul Stolikoff Jr. became president of the Niagara Falls Power Company, it had a current day value of $1 billion. I guess he did a good job buying a business, making it successful. Okay. And Sholokov's sons all studied chemistry in Germany. They all sent them back to Germany to go to German institutions. And they found that Sholokov, Hartford, and Hanna, which later became known as Allied Chemical. Well, when Sholokov bought the power authority canal, he lived in that small house at 486 Franklin Street. That house is still standing. It's uh, one house away from uh, Allen Street on Franklin. And then he built the mansion, which you can see in the bottom left. Surprised there's no good pictures of that mansion. That was at 533 Delaware. And then his family ended up moving to uh, 6892 Lakeshore Road, uh, which you can see there in the bottom picture. And is anybody here interested in moving? Okay, because a Sholokov property at 1180 Amherst Street just went on the market for 2.5 million. So if anybody is thinking of moving there, you can gladly hire me and I'll live above the garage. <laughs> well, August uh, Eisenbein studied architecture at the University of Stuttgart in Germany. And he trained in Paris before he came to Buffalo in the 1880s. The first building he designed in Buffalo was the first music hall, which we just talked about, which was built by Becker and Sholokov. At the Pan American Exhibition, he was one of eight official architects. And he designed the Temple of Music. That was that amazing building where uh, McKinley ended up uh, being assassinated. And his firm of uh, Eisen, Dean, and Johnson, along with Wicks and Green, were considered the two most prestigious architectural firms in uh, the Buffalo area at the turn of the century. We mentioned Gerhard Lang. He donated money for uh, St. Louis Church. Well, he was born in Germany in 1834. He moved to Buffalo in 1848. He worked at his father's butcher shop. That's where he learned to speak English. A lot of people came here. They didn't speak any English. They just spoke German. They ended up learning English after they came here. But there's a lot of similarities between uh, German and uh, English. And there's very little similarities between the Slavic languages and English. And I covered that in my uh, book on the 1800s. A lot of uh, Polish people didn't stay in Buffalo because they couldn't assimilate to the languages until Father Pitt has started St. Stanislaus Parish on the east side of Buffalo. Well, anyways, Lane ended up marrying Barbara Bourne in 1860. Her father owned an early brewery, which became Bourne and Lane, and eventually the Gerhard Lane Brewery. Well, Lane traveled all around the country, looking at different techniques and the best designs for a brewery. He ended up opening the Gerhard Lane Brewery, which you can see there was on Jefferson in between Best and Dodge. And when it opened, it was called the Palace Brewery because of its elegant Victorian design. Now, during this time, the brewing business was different, okay? A lot of the breweries financed or owned taverns in the area. In fact, the Lane Brewery actually owned 80 taverns in Western Europe. Because of that, they became one of the best-selling beers in Buffalo. Now, William Simon's father owned a brewery in Germany. And uh, he taught his son the art of making beer. At 17, William Simon came to the US, became a master brewer in New York City and Boston. And then he was asked to move to Buffalo at the request of Gerhard Lane, because Lane was having a problem in his brewery and William Simon was a master brewer. Well, due to illness, he ended up going back to Germany for a time. He came back to Buffalo and he ended up uh, purchasing the Schlossler Brewery at Emsley and Clinton. They reopened after Prohibition and remained in business until 1973. That's the brewery up there in the top right-hand corner. And uh, William Simon IV still owns that brewery on Clinton and Emsley, and he may reopen it as a microbrewery. If he does that, it's going to be the second oldest brewery in the United States. Wow. So let, let's hope that he does. And historically, the first brewery in Buffalo was opened in 1826 by Rudolf Beer. In 1900, the U.S. Brewmasters Association had their annual meeting in Buffalo. They took a vote for the official language of the group to remain German. Interesting, eh? And when the Pan American Exhibition opened in 1901, there was 100 breweries in Buffalo. And at the start of Prohibition, 29 were still operating. Well, some of them didn't close, did they? Okay. Well, anyways, 
George Schuster was the son of a blacksmith, and his father had been a horseshoer in the German army. Well, his father's shop was on Seneca Street, right across the street from uh, the Larkin buildings, that where the uh, Larkin administration building was. And there, George learned everything about forging and welding and uh, working with iron and steel. Well, he became involved in bicycle racing, and he got positions with a whole bunch of different bicycle companies. In 1902, he took the job with the E.R. Thomas Motor Company, making radiators for the Thomas one-cylinder, two-seater cars. He quickly rose in the company, becoming a troubleshooter, a final assembly supervisor, and the delivery representative for people purchasing vehicles. When you bought a car then, somebody from the factory came to your house and showed you how to drive it, how to maintain it. Not like today, you go into the place, they give you the keys and they say, good luck. You know, so uh, Schuster actually went around the country, you know, training people to drive their cars. Well, after the Thomas Flyer was entered in what was called the New York to Paris race, it was like an around the world great race, Schuster was named the chief mechanic, and he took over as the driver of that uh, car in Wyoming. They competed against cars from Germany, France, and Italy. Well, there was no roads then. There was no gas stations and everything like that, right? So when they were crossing the U.S., the Thomas Flyer encountered snow drifts, like we will tonight, where their progress was measured in feet per hour. They were also pulled through the snow by horses, which I feel gave a new meaning to horsepower. And there were no roads. So Schuster would drive the car on railroad tracks. Unfortunately, when the express train was coming from the other direction, he had to get off the tracks, because who had the right of way? <laughs> and uh, they broke down in uh, Nevada. There's a picture of the car breaking down. You can see it in the creek over there. And it was actually sinking inside of quicksand. Well, Schuster remembered that he sold a car not far from there. So he got on a horse, he drove over to where he sold that car, took all the parts off of that car, put it on this car, and they continued the race. He promised them they were going to come back and give the parts, but who knows if they did. And uh, he was the uh, first and only driver to arrive in, well, first arrive in San Francisco, and the only to travel to Alaska. Because they had this race plan that you get to Alaska in the wintertime, and they thought they could drive down the rivers in Alaska and just drive across the Bering Straits in the cars. <laughs> Couldn't do it. Okay, so they ended up shipping his car back to San Francisco. And then all the cars got shipped across the Pacific. Thomas Flyer had to be carried around 90 degree turns in Japan. Sometimes they had to remove parts from houses because the streets were so narrow. They had to be pushed up hills in uh, China. They had to make deals uh, to be able to buy gasoline. Since he spoke German, he was lucky because there was a lot of Germans there where he uh, ended up being able to make deals. And they were confronted by bandits in Manchuria. Well, bottom right-hand picture. They were stopped at the city line in Paris by a policeman because he did not want to let them into Paris because one of their headlights was broken. <laughs> and to be able to enter Paris, you had to have two working headlights. So they said, what are we going to do? The policeman said, you can't come in. He said, we just drove all the way around the world. You know, we're finally at the finish line, and you're not going to let us in. He said, Monsieur, you must have two headlights. So a guy's going by in a bicycle. Now, Schuster was a mechanic. So he tried taking the headlight off of the bicycle to put it on his car. It didn't work. So he says, hell, what am I going to do? I got it. He took the bicycle, tied it onto the hood of the car, and said, we now have two headlights. <laughs> and the policeman said, you may enter. <laughs> well, the Germans actually got to uh, Paris uh, four days earlier, but they were penalized because when he was riding on the tracks in the United States, the Germans put their car on trains and went down the tracks. So they were penalized 15 days, the naughty Germans. And then they were also penalized 15 days because they didn't get to Alaska. So a guy from Buffalo, New York, was declared the winner in a car made in Buffalo, New York, of what was really the first race around the world. Well, Schuster later went to work uh, for the Pierce Aero Company, and he was in charge of truck deliveries all around the world, including Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and China. He lived to the age of 99. A movie was made about his trip called The Great Race. I don't know if you ever saw that it starred Tony Curtis and Natalie Wood. 
Schuster's great-grandson filmed a documentary, and today he goes around the world giving talks about uh, the race and things that happened. Some of the juicy things that I told you about I ended up getting from his great-grandson. In fact, he was a ship captain, the great-grandson. He lived down in Florida. And there's a museum in Springville. If you have a chance to go there, they actually have a lot of stuff about uh, Schuster's car. Well, William and Henry Went were both born in Buffalo, but their grandparents had immigrated from Germany. They were leaders in the forging business. In a Buffalo forge, they created a gear-driven uh, bellows rather than blacksmith bellows to make the forges work better. The company eventually occupied an entire city block on Broadway. They employed mainly skilled German workers that lived within that area, became one of the largest manufacturers in the city of Buffalo. Well, William's daughter, Margaret, became one of the best known philanthropists in uh, the Western New York area. What I didn't know is tragically, only two years after she established the One Foundation, she suffered a stroke. And she was in a coma for the last 13 years of her life. So Margaret never knew all the good things that uh, her foundation you know, did and continues to do for the city of Buffalo. Well, Henry ended up taking over the business after William left it and also passed away. And uh, they ran uh, the business all the way to the 1940s. He left us with his uh, Lincoln Parkway mansion, which you can see there, which recently sold for just due for $2 million. And his summer home on Lake Erie is now in disrepair, but that's now one beach park. That was one summer home. Talking about German food, okay, Christian Klink arrived in Buffalo from Germany in the late 1850s. He formed the Christian Klink Packing Company in South Buffalo. His plant on Depot Street uh, between uh, William and Howard covered 25 acres and had 25 different buildings. Jacob Dolt, there's his plant over there, opened a meatpacking plant in Abbott Road in the 1860s. He moved to the east side and he had his plant, which you can see here on William and you know, Fillmore. He actually had an exhibit at uh, the uh, Pan American Exhibition, and by the 1920s, he also had plants in Kansas City and Wichita. This was a Buffalo-based company, okay? They had over 2,000 employees and an over $3 million annual budget just for employees in the 1920s. The company was later sold to high grade, and today it's owned by Sara Lee, so it's really still in existence to this day. Louis Furman, who you can see on the far right, was born in Buffalo. He started working in the meatpacking business in 1892. He had a meatpacking plant on 1010 Clinton. He was elected mayor of Buffalo two terms. After he wasn't uh, elected again, what did he do? He went back to his meatpacking plant. In fact, Furman Boulevard, okay, which will probably be closed because of the snowstorm, is named after him. Here's my favorite mayor in the history of the city of Buffalo. His name was Francis Schwab. You can't get more German than that, okay? He was mayor of Buffalo from 1922 to 1929. So he was mayor during Prohibition. And before he was elected mayor, what did he do? He was a brewer working for Germania Brewing, Iroquois Beer, and the Buffalo Brewing Company. When he was elected mayor, he had charges pending against him for making real beer rather than fake beer. So he had a higher alcohol count. And he pleaded nolo contendieri, which means I accept the conviction of guilty, but I do not admit to any guilt. Well, this uh, led to an ongoing feud with U.S. Attorney uh, Donovan over uh, the enforcement of prohibition laws. And Schwab caused another controversy when he refused to endorse the Miss Buffalo portion of the Miss America contest because he thought the swimsuit competitions were immoral and degrading. And he also was successful in expelling the KKK from Buffalo, but they threatened his life and his sister's life for him to get him out of town. And he financed a uh, Hotel de Glink, that's what it was called. It was a free hotel on Lower Main Street. Now we have a code blue. Where's everybody gonna go when it's cold? He opened this hotel to give people a place to stay. Well, all the businessmen hated it, but uh, all the social activists totally embraced everything he was doing. During his administration, okay, the Peace Bridge was built, the Central Terminal opened, construction began on City Hall, and there he is pictured with Charles Lindbergh. He was responsible for starting the beginning of the building of the Buffalo Airport. Charles Resch 
began working with his father, Jacob Rush, in 1901 with his retail meat business in the Washington market. That's one of the first things we talked about, the Washington market. He married Mabel Clink. We talked about him also. There was the daughter of William Clink, who had a 25-acre uh, meatpacking plant. And his mother's brother was Mir Furman, who we also just mentioned. Well, after his father's death, Charles opened a meat business at the Broadway market. He was assigned chairman of the health board by Mir Schwab. And Rush and Schwab clashed. They didn't get along. Rush was fired from the health board, but due to his popularity with the Republican Party, he got the Republican nomination. Oh, that's backwards. Buffalo's now Democratic, but back then Buffalo was Republican. So whoever got the Republican nomination then won, like now Mayor Brown, Brown always runs uh, uncontested. So he ended up beating Schwab in the general election. And he was elected mayor during the Depression. And he implemented a whole bunch of public works programs. In fact, he built War Memorial Stadium, the Rock Pile, okay, which was originally known as Rush Stadium. Well, when Mayor Rush died, his son Charles J. took over the Broadway market. When he retired, his son Charles W. took over. And he created the Charlie the Butcher persona. And his wife Bonnie had the first food truck. Okay, I got a whole bunch of information that in the uh, latest book, you know, that I wrote. So, thanks to Charlie the Butcher and others, Buffalo's known for beef on weck, as well as we're known for chicken wings. And where did beef on weck all start? Okay, there was a baker by the name of William Bow who moved to Buffalo from the Black Forest area of Germany. He brought salted kimowak with him. And uh, all the, like you said, the uh, taverns were owned by the breweries. They all started selling roast beef on Kimowak because it was salty and made everybody drink more, so everybody would buy salty. Okay. And I thought, of it. if I ever want a beer, I'll just have a Kimowak sandwich and then, uh, no, okay. But when you mention beef on Wack, okay, you have to include the prevalence of hot dog manufacturers in Buffalo. Okay, the Polish sausage makers like Shelengowski and Wardinsky and Malecki all relocated to Buffalo from Poland and started making their sausages on the east side. But they were preceded by German sausage maker Joseph Salins. Salins opened his shop all the way back in 1869. And they replaced Malecki's, the exclusive hot dog sold at Ted's in 1988. By 1994, they controlled 70% of the hot dog market. Today, Salins is sold in 35 states and they're in their fifth generation of Salins running the business. But, well, nothing goes along with hot dogs more than America's favorite pastime. Even the Baseball Bisons Park is now known as Salem Field. Well, Gottfried Offerman trained as a butcher in Germany. He moved to the U.S. at age 16, joined the Union Army, came to Buffalo, and he started a butcher shop. In fact, he worked for uh, Christian Klink. His son, Frank Offerman, graduated from college and he opened an advertising promotions company. And in 1920, he purchased the Buffalo Bisons team. He built up attendance, Mary he owned an advertising promotion company, by giving free admission to ladies and promotions like giving away an automobile. Offerman installed lighting at the stadium and played the first night game in Buffalo in July of 1930, five years before any of the major league teams had night games. And he was also the first minor league team to have the games broadcast on the radio. Some baseball player by the name of Babe Ruth, I don't know if you ever heard of him. Well, anyways, he used to play exhibition games in Buffalo. And on the way to the stadium, he'd always stop for a couple beers and German's food at Aldrich's Tavern. Aldrich's is actually the oldest bar in Buffalo. And after Offerman's death in 1935, the Bison Stadium was renamed Offerman Stadium, and he was one of the inaugural inductees into the Buffalo Hall of Fame. Well, Offerman lived not that far from here. He lived in Grand Island, and he was one of the main proponents for building the Grand Island Bridge. Imagine you have to take a barge across the Grand Island Bridge to get there. Well, you told me you can't go on the Grand Island Bridge. You know, my, my wife said when she was young, her uncle told her that close your eyes when we go over the Grand Island Bridge, because we have to go all the way up on the top thing, and you don't want to see it. Mm -hmm. She still believes it till this mm -hmm. day. In fact, she always says to me, you're not going to go up on top of it, are you? Okay. Well, anyways, the road between the two Grand Island Bridges was originally going to be called Offerman Drive. Well, the Wurlitzer Company, 
I passed it on the way coming here, okay? It was founded in Cincinnati, Ohio by German immigrants, Franz Rudolf Wurlitzer. They sold band instruments. In fact, uh, they initially imported the instruments from members of the Wurlitzer family that had remained in Germany. But Wurlitzer had a contract to supply all the brass instruments to the U.S. Army during the Civil War. Baron Eugene de Klinks was born in Dusseldorf. He trained as a barrel organ builder, established his business in London, and when the tariffs on organs were imposed, he ended up uh, moving to North Tonawanda in 1892, where he worked with carousel manufacturer Alan Herschel. And he formed the North Tonawanda Barrel Organ Company, which changed its name to the Declines Musical Instruments Company, and they opened a factory in Martinsville. And uh, he began selling his products to other instrument makers. Well, he approached Wurlitzer, and uh, they didn't want to purchase his barrel organs, but they really liked this coin-operated piano that he had. So he built up a relationship with them. Well, the Kleins was elected mayor of North Tonawanda. And he ended up, you know, sort of breaking away from the company. And uh, Rudolf Wurlitzer decided to buy the company, and he took over the Martinsville plant. The Kleins retired. What did he do? He moved back to Germany. And uh, in fact, there was a Declines house on uh, Goundry Street in North Tonawanda, and I used to live across the street from it. Uh, Bill Gosh, that's a um, 98-year-old Marine Corps uh, veteran who just had the story about him going to the Bills game. He lives in the old Declines house, and he was my neighbor across the street. And at the Wurlitzer plant, they uh, manufactured theater organs, radios, and jukeboxes. The instrument portion of the business was sold to Baldwin Piano and subsequently Gibson Guitars. If you know anything about music, that's two really fantastic companies. <laughs> and his jukebox business was sold to a German company. Well, he came over from Germany, right? And they moved operations back to Hillhorst, Germany. And of course, I know the Wurlitzer building still exists because I saw it when I was coming here. If not, I guess I'm in the twilight zone. Well, also right around the corner from where we are today, a guy by the name of Walter Dornberger and Werner von Braun, uh, under the command of Albert Speer and Heinrich Himmler, worked on the V-1 and the V-2 rockets for Germany during World War II. Well, after the successful launch of the V-2, Dornberger actually met with uh, Hitler at the Wolfslayer. And Hitler apologized to Dornberger. Supposedly, it's the only person Hitler ever apologized to. Because he said, I'm going to make a rocket, and he said, you won't be able to do it. And he did it. And uh, he apologized for doubting him. He called Von Braun uh, the professor. Well, together, Dornberger and Von Braun surrendered to the Americans at the end of the war, cooperated with the English government, and under the operation of uh, something called Operation Paperclip, their SS association and use of labor workers was expunged from their records. So they came to the United States. In fact, Dornberger then worked making missiles for the United States Air Force for three years. So after working for the Air Force, he developed guided missiles uh, for Bell aircraft. And he worked for Bell from 1950 to 1965. And he rose to the position of vice president. And you can see him there and then him uh, right before he surrendered with uh, Von Braun. That top picture was of something called the X-20 dinosaur. Uh, Dornberger created that at the very beginning of the space program. They turned it down, just having the capsules with the guys coming down. Well, that ended up coming back in, what was it called? The space shuttle. So a guy working for Bell Aircraft observed German ancestry, he actually uh, did the space shuttle. And he lived in Snyder, retired to a home in the Boston Hills, which is probably totally covered with snow right now, and then he returned to Germany. Closing out the presentation, you know, German music and Germans today are very popular with everything that really goes on in this area. The Irish have St. Patrick's Day, and many of the other uh, ethnic groups have festivals where their music is featured. Well, German music had been the main music that was performed in all the beer halls in uh, the United Buffalo area during the 1800s. This continued until World War I, when the attitude towards the Germans changed. Even everybody who's here living in America it was uh, derogatory to the Germans. In fact, the German <coughs> bank, big bank that uh, Becker started, an insurance company, they ended up changing their name to the Liberty Bank. And a lot of the bars ended up stopping having German bands. Well, then World War II ended, Prohibition started. 
By the time Prohibition ended, everybody forgot about World War I. And everybody started, uh, you know, going to see German bands again. It was the main music at restaurants like Braun's Park, Kathy Heidelberg, Hans Geyers, George Tridel, some places in Buffalo. What was the pay for musicians back then? Okay, a musician got paid three dollars a night, but if it was a Saturday, they got paid four bucks. Okay, you wouldn't be. That's not even enough for gas to get to a job today. Well, at the beginning of World War II, the amount of German music was again reduced. However, after the war, everybody realized that German music is not just played by Germans. Let's not hold what happened during World War II against the nationality. It was played by everybody. So German bands and associations all became popular. The German American Musicians Association was formed in 1933. Right out this way, the Bergholz Band was formed in 1971. The Oslanders in 1974 and the Frankfurters in 1982. The first Oktoberfest was held in the Buffalo area in 1964. The first thing I did when I got to Germany was go to a wine festival. The second thing I did when I got to Germany in the Air Force was go to Oktoberfest. What an indoctrination. Okay, well anyways, now Oktoberfest events are held at various clubs, community centers, and municipalities all around Western New York. Now that Hofbrau House is open, German music is heard on a regular basis everywhere. German heritage is shared by so many people and is the biggest ethnic population group right now in the Western New York area. So now I have to ask you, did I talk about some things that you did not know? Mm -hmm. Did I bring up some things that you might have forgotten and now you remember? Mm -hmm. Most important, okay, after hearing about all these accomplishments of German Americans in our community, are you proud of your German heritage and being from Western New York? Yes. Hope, after you heard about what all these people did, <laughs> are you proud of your heritage and being from Western New York? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> By the way, any questions? No?